Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about Radiant GI and how to configure it. Now, first we need to create a new project in Unity. Open the Unity Hub and select New Project. Now, under New Project, make sure you are using Unity 2021.3 and above. Select 3D URP and create a new project. Wait until everything is set up and then go to the Package Manager. In the Package Manager, go under My Assets and search for Radiant GI. Download the asset and import it into the project. Now that everything is important, you can close the Package Manager and check out the asset. In the README file, there are some instructions. It says we should open the project settings, edit project settings, and go to the graphics panel. Double click on the URP asset. Then double click on that. And you have to add render feature and select radiant render feature. Now make sure that rendering path is the same in both the URP asset and the rendering feature. So if you're using forward, use forward, and if you're using deferred, use deferred. Now we're ready to check out the asset. You can go into the documentation folder and check out the documentation for more information. Let's check out the demo scene Atrium. Just double click on the scene, don't save the current one. If you check the Radiant GI Volume object, you can see the settings for the Radiant Global Illumination feature. There are three categories. General settings, quality versus performance, and the third area is a debug area, in which we have options to see how the effect is applied and how the different elements are combined. So, now let's go over some of these features. Indirect intensity, I think, is obvious. If you manipulate the value here, you can see how it affects the intensity of the effect. Distance attenuation refers to the attenuation of the light over distance. By default, it's zero. But if we increase that, you will see that the light diminishes as it moves further away from the light source. One ray bounce computes an extra ray from the indirect light. It reuses rays from previous frames to stay performant, but if you really want to have the maximum performance, leave it unchecked. Max source brightness limits the brightness of the light sources. This can reduce artifacts like flickering or fireflies that may be introduced if the values are very excessive. Normal map influence affects how much the normal map is taken into account when a surface is lit. If we reduce this to zero, you can see that the normal maps are barely affecting the wall here. But here, which, where the effect is reduced, the normal maps are working as expected. So we can increase this to one to take into account the normal maps fully, or we can play with a value somewhere in between if we don't like the effect as much. Luma influence is used in forward rendering mode to overcome a limitation in that mode. Now that we went through the general settings, we can go through quality versus performance. First, there is ray count. Radiant uses ray margin on the GPU, casting thousands of hundreds of rays per frame in screen space in order to calculate indirect lighting. If we skip ahead and go to the debug view and enable it, we can go under the drop down here and select ray cast. You can see these are the rays, right? And if I increase the ray count, the number of rays is increased. This will offer a smoother result but will also affect performance. Let's turn off the debug. Max distance refers to the distance the rays travel. If I reduce the max distance, you can see that the effect of the light from the ball is reduced. Max samples refers to the accuracy of the sampling over the ray cast. If I decrease the max samples, they will be less accurate, but they will be more performant. Now you can see there is a ringing effect when I decrease the max samples so much. This is helped with jittering. If I increase jittering, this is smoothed out. Of course, three samples are not enough. Something over 12 is desired. Default is 24. 
jittering should be a small amount. Thickness refers, as the tooltip tells us, to the assumed thickness of any geometry. It is used to determine if a ray crosses the surface. If I increase it here, you can see that shadows are created. Adjust this value in order to create more accurate results. Binary search is turned on by default. You can see that when I turn it off, the result isn't very accurate. Binary search increases the accuracy of the result. After this is downsampling, which is obvious we are reducing the accuracy of the result. After that, it is smoothing with a few levels, zero, which looks like something like this. And then by increasing it, the result is smoother with four being the max. Finally, we can talk about temporal reprojection, which is a technique that allows Radiant GI to perform as well as it does. Temporal reprojection refers to the technique of using data from previous frames in the current frame to smooth out the result. Now, the effect isn't visible in edit mode. We have to press play in order to see it. And I'm going to remove compare mode and I'm just going to enable temporal accumulation buffer. And you can see how this looks. Reuse rays is another option. It means I can reuse rays from previous frames. I reduce this to zero, the effect is noisier. If I increase it, it's smoother, but trails might appear. Response speed refers to the uh, speed at which previous frames are discarded. If I increase this, it becomes noisier, but it is more responsive. If I reduce this, I can see trails because it's not as responsive. A value of around 10 is fine. Camera translation response is the speed at which values are updated when the camera is moving. If the camera is moving fast in your scene, increase this value to reduce trails. Depth rejection is a similar technique. It refers to objects moving in the scene and changing depth. If the difference in depth value is big enough, that means that the object has moved away and we have to update the data. Now we can talk about the debug region. Showing edit mode allows us to see the debugs in edit mode instead of pressing play to see them each time. But I want to press play now so I can show you something. The first option in debug view is albedo. I can see the colors of the scene. Then we have normals. I can see the normals of the scene. Specular, the specular component. Raycast, I can see the rays. Then downscaled half is the rays downscaled in half, and this, is, and this is part of the smoothing process. Downscaled quarter is also another pass. Upscaled to half, another pass. And then I can see the temporal accumulation buffer, which is what we discussed previously. We can see how all this is put together and smoothed out over time. Final GI is the final component, which is added as lighting to the scene. By going back to none, we can see the final result. Compare mode allows us to see the few side by side. We can have same side or just a split. By changing the line angle, we can rotate this and line width just increases the width of the line. If I keep same side, this changes into panning, which allows me to move side by side. Now you can see here that it says this scene has no real lights. Run it to see direct lighting created by Radiant GI because the temporal accumulation buffer doesn't exist. So I'm just going to press play and you can see here that once I press play, the result accumulates and then smooths out. You can see the values here. Now I'm going to take you through the Radiant GI folder structure. Demos contains the demos and some URP settings if you don't have any already. Documentation, the PDF I showed you at the beginning. Editor, some editor scripts so we can have the correct representation of our settings in the editor. Runtime contains the resources which contains the shader and a few other things that are used for the, by the shader. And finally, the scripts folder which has some scripts inside which are commented and you can adjust to your liking. 